I'm Ray Stewart. I'm speaking to you from the Monastery of St. Paul in Pittsburgh. Behind me are novices and priests of the order known as the Passionist Fathers. They are robing for a ceremony which you are going to be privileged to see. Now this is a sandal. It is a part of the habit worn by the discalced or barefoot monks who live in this monastery. During the next hour, we're going to show you how they live, how they work and study here in the monastery and in their formation as Roman Catholic priests. We have a great deal to be seen here in the next hour, so let's be on our way. High on a hilltop overlooking Pittsburgh's famed Golden Triangle stands the Monastery of St. Paul of the Cross. Here lives the monk, the priest, the confrater, the brother, the novice, the postulant, the cleric. Strange names outside these monastery walls, but all a part of the spirit and purpose of these religious men. They have turned their backs upon the material things of this world. They have renounced marriage, forsaken worldly possessions, and promised a life of complete obedience to their superiors in the congregation by choosing to live under the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. In their black habits and sandals, these cloistered men fervently seek their goal. What is that goal and why do they seek it? Why do they renounce the world and embrace an austere life of self-denial in a monastery? These are a few of the questions we will try to answer as we look into the life of one group of priests, the Passionist Fathers. Passionist Fathers are widely known. This crucifix and platform at the sanctuary rail is distinctive of the missions that they conduct in churches throughout the world. It is the prime purpose of this order to preach the passion of Jesus and to serve as missionaries. I'd like for you to meet one of the priests of this order, Father Martin Joseph. Uh, Father Martin, uh, could you describe for us a little bit of the uh, garb that you are wearing here? Well, as you see, Ray, the habit of the passionist is black, and it began when St. Paul of the Cross was inspired by Our Lady to wear a habit of mourning. This habit means that those who wear it will meditate on the passion of Christ, and those who preach it will announce this word. When you preach on this platform, you are dressed as you are now, I understand, except for the mantle. This. That's right. During the time of missions, we wear the mantle for the announcements, and then for the big sermon, we take the mantle off. Well, Father Martin, what prompted you to become a priest? Well, actually, the work of the priest gave me the inspiration. And when did you decide to become a priest? Well, about two years after I graduated from high school. Uh, can you cite what specifically prompted you? Had you thought of it while you were in high school? Well, in a rather general way, I guess, I was thinking about it, but the decisive moment came when I had made a mission with the Passionist Fathers. A uh, mission, just as we are showing here, we haven't seen it, That's but right. uh, similar to what we've described here. Yes. Uh, you had, in deciding to become a priest, uh, considered other uh, fields of the priesthood. Uh, yes, I did. I was very much concerned about the diocesan clergy, and also a few other of the orders. Mm -hmm. But it was the mission where uh, a passionist father, such as you now are, uh, preached a mission, and uh, this inspired you to, to come into this order. That's correct. And how long have you been a passionist priest? Well, I have been a priest for 14 years now. And uh, your work has been as satisfying as you thought it would be originally? Yes, even more so. Uh -huh. Well, thank you very much, uh, Father Martin Joseph. We would like to uh, go along now and give you more indications of the life these men lead in the monasteries. But aside from the garb, which is unique, another unique feature of the Passionist Fathers is this. Now, this is a rattle, and it wakes them up at 2 o'clock in the morning like this.
and so the night's sleep is interrupted by the raucous beat of the rattle. They are instructed after the words of St. Teresa to rise from the bed as if it were on fire. This pre-dawn watch follows the earliest known traditions of the Christian church, which in turn borrowed much of its form from ancient Hebrew worship. This early watch is now confined almost entirely to the monastic life. again at six o'clock and back in the monk's choir to chant the divine office of prime and tears. At 6.30 they have Holy Communion and Mass. By 7.30 they're ready for a breakfast of coffee and bread. This they take standing. The words postulant, novice, confrater, brother, and cleric have been used, and it might be well at this point to define a few terms. The young men you see are aspiring to become priests and brothers of the order. The first step is that of postulant. He has not been invested in the habit of the order. A novice has been invested and is undergoing a year of intense spiritual and ascetical development, after which he takes the vows of the religious life. The novice brother will go on for specialized training in the housekeeping and manual duties of the order. The novice cleric, called confrater, will enter training for the priesthood. Whether they aspire to be priests or brothers, they are together in this formative period. The purpose of the monastic life is to live apart from the world and to maintain an austere life of prayer, meditation, and self-denial. Each of the 65 rooms in the monastery, whether for priest or brother, confrater or novice, is small and plain. Each man cares for his own. The bed upon which he sleeps consists of a mattress placed on planks which are supported by modified sawhorses. There is no rug. Otherwise, he has only a desk and a couple of chairs. Here is a comment by one of the novices about the routine daily chores associated with the monastery life. Every novice has a portion of the house to keep clean. And besides the practical value of working and keeping the monastery as tidily as we can, there is a spiritual value which we place in all our menial tasks. This spiritual value we believe in helps the growth of our soul, plus it has an apostolic value of applying graces to the church through our daily tasks in obedience with our superiors. Cooking is done by brothers of the order, and I can personally vouch for their excellence, but their skills do not stop here. They must be shoemakers as well. The sandals they wear around the monastery are made and repaired right here in the monastery shop by accomplished brothers trained in this ancient art. Brothers make the customary tunic of the Passionist congregation, and uh, we make them for the novices when they're first, first vested, and we also uh, make them for the professed members of the community. It's the first tablet that they receive, and uh, probably the habit that they'll uh, continue to wear for the rest of their life. A monastery must be prepared for every eventuality, and so a dispensary is maintained to take care of the minor aches and pains of the day. More serious illnesses receive prompt medical attention. Not much glamour there, sleep interrupted in the middle of the night, mundane daily chores, but the life is not without its spiritual peaks and emotional rewards. Behind me, they are preparing for one of the ceremonies that marks the difference between the diocesan priest, or the priest who will serve the bishop of a diocese, and those who live and work in a religious order such as this. I want to talk with one of those men now. He is Confrater Flavian, who has decided to become a priest in this order. First, why did you decide to become a priest? Well, the life of the priest appealed to me 
because in serving my own soul, I could, in the acts of the ministry, help others to save their souls also. And what specifically led you to the religious order such as this? Well, the particular apostolate of the Passionist, preaching missions and retreats and parishes, seemed to me to be more appealing than regular pastoral duties. Mm -hmm. And also, it entails living in a monastery. And in the monastery, we are removed from the distractions of daily life in the world, you might say, and we are left more time to prepare ourselves and our sermons and preaching assignments when we are sent out. Mm -hmm. And that is the combination of the contemplative uh, life that we have referred to and the active life. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. the Primarily, you're going to be a minister, a preacher of the passion. That's right. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And uh, you have a long way to go from here now. Oh, quite a few years. When we, leave, when we are professed this coming August, we will leave here and go to Hartford, Connecticut to begin seven years of specialized study for the priesthood. What led you into the religious life specifically? There are different things that you could have done. What prompted you in the first place? Well, I wanted to be a priest. I was born into a passionist parish and lived in that parish all through my grammar school, associated with passionist priests, brothers, and students on their way to the passionist priesthood. And so when the time came to decide what kind of a priest I would like to be, well, the decision was almost made for me, you might say, and I just naturally slid into the Passionist. All right, thank you very much, Confrater Flavian. The postulants are candidates for membership in the order founded by St. Paul of the Cross are about to be invested with the habit of the order. Now this is a crown of thorns, <coughs> familiarly associated with the crucifixion of our Lord. Because of their concern for the passion of Jesus, this crown of thorns plays a prominent role in the investing ceremonies. And so before the crucifix, which is the emblem of the congregation, those who are to be invested with the habit of St. Paul of the Cross proceed in traditional splendor to the sanctuary where, before God and in the presence of friends and relatives, they ceremoniously withdraw from the world and embrace the religious life. Novices robed in white form the choir for the ceremonies of this important day. in black suits will kneel in a semicircle before the altar. The priest who is to be celebrant, vested in alb, stole, and coat, proceeds with his assistants to the altar where he says the opening prayer. priest then invokes the blessings of God upon the habits to be worn henceforth by the new novices. This habit consists of a tunic, belt, and mantle. After the habits are blessed and the prayers are said, the postulants and habits are sprinkled with holy water by the priest. At this point in the ceremony, the celebrant leaves his position at the altar and together with his assistants, takes a seat at the side of the sanctuary. It is time for the sermon. The priest who is to deliver the sermon goes to the altar. His words will, be, will explain how, symbolically, they are putting off their former selves and putting on a new self. 
but that this transformation cannot be done in a single instant, nor overnight, nor in a period of years, but will require constant endeavor to set aside whatever may be low, base, or imperfect in their personality and build up the perfect man who resides potentially in each of them. The time has come for the postulants to put aside their secular clothes and don the habit of the order. As the priest intones, may the Lord divest you of the old man and his deeds that you may put on the Jesus Christ crucified, he removes the postulant's jacket and tie. Thus he is divested of his clothing that he may wear the black tunic. While putting on the habit, the priest says, may the Lord vest you with this somber tunic of penance so you may constantly look upon Jesus and weep over him as one is wont to weep over the death of the firstborn. With the belt, he says, may the Lord bind you with the cincture of charity and justice, that standing faithfully by the cross, you may be inseparably joined to him in the bond of divine love. He continues, O Lord, grant that your servant may wear this mantle in such a manner that, being sustained by continual meditation on the passion, he may practice the mortification of the flesh. Accept this cross in the memory of our Lord. Deny yourself under the mighty hand of God that you may dwell with him for everlasting life. Receive this crown of thorns in memory of our Lord. Humble yourself and for his sake be subject to every creature. This solemn ceremony continues until all have been invested. approaches the altar, the priest takes the cross from his shoulder and gives him a lighted candle, saying, Accept the light of Christ, that being dead to the world, you may live for Christ. Rise up from the dead, and Christ will enlighten you. is now, and being newly invested, they are given the kiss of peace by all. Thus are they welcomed into the congregation of the discalced clerics of the most holy cross and passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, commonly known as the Passionist Fathers. As religious orders go, this one is young and vigorous. It was organized in Italy in 1720 by Paul Francis Donio. As a boy, he regularly arose in the middle of the night to pray. One day, while meditating, he saw a vision of Mary, the mother of Jesus. She was clothed as the Passionists are now clothed, and she called upon young Paul to form a congregation which would continually mourn for the passion and death of her son. Paul Francis Donio later became St. Paul of the Cross. The year ahead is full of boundless experiences for the novice. Tirocinium is the ancient word for the novitiate. This gate is locked, and by canon law, the novices are separated from the other priests and brothers of the order. At this time, we would like to talk with one of the brothers, Brother Lawrence. 
Uh, Brother Lawrence, uh, how long have you been in the order? Well, I'm a newcomer, Ray. I've been here just about four months. And uh, what did you do before you came in? Well, I uh, worked for Crucible Steel Company uh, of America for some 20 years. You came into this from uh, business life or work life. That's then. right. Uh, 20 years working, what caused you to decide to, be co to come into this order? Well, I think that uh, in the last few years, I began to feel uh, discontented with uh, the life I was leading and uh, turned more, I guess, to this type of life. Mm -hmm. uh, what you were seeking was the contemplative order such as uh, you have gotten into. That's right. Yeah, this uh, passionless life of uh, prayer and penance, mm -hmm. solitude. Had you given this type of life any thought when you were in school 20 years ago? Well, uh, I would say not uh, too much thought at all. Mm -hmm. I think every boy has a little bit of idea of uh, wanting to be a religious, but uh, I think no more than not that. Not seriously yeah. at that time. Huh? Well, what uh, is the difference? I introduced you as a brother, and I have uh, re referred to others as clerics and confraters and so forth. Uh, what's the difference? Well, the difference to me, I think, is this, that the brother is the let's say, the housekeeper of this institute. Uh, he doesn't uh, preach the gospel or minister the sacraments or offer mass like the priest, but he does run the house, do the, does the sewing, the cooking, uh, the maintenance, the infirmarian work. You're the supporting cetera. arm. Uh, uh, we do the work. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you go, uh, but through this period of the novitiate and uh, postulancy and so forth, you're together with the clerics, aren't you? Yes, we are. Uh, you take the, the same. Through the novitiate, and then at the end of the novitiate, uh, we move on to Hartford uh, for a three-year period for special training. For your specific training. And clerics may be there for a year mm -hmm. for scholastic studies. But up until your profession, you take the same studies and basic That's studies. right. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much, Brother thank Lawrence. You. Mention has been made of the rule under which they are learning to live. That rule is contained in this book. At this point, I would like for you to meet Father Gregory. He is also known as Father Master because he is the master of novices here. Father Gregory, as master of novices, what are your responsibilities? These responsibilities are many and weighty, for upon the right training of the novices depends the good of the entire congregation. Right here, you see one of the principal exercises of the novitiate, the chapter or morning class. Primarily, the master is a teacher, one who imparts knowledge of the spiritual life, religious discipline, the passionist spirit. Each morning, the novices gather at 8.30 for instruction. In the beginning, the lectures treat of the art and science of mental prayer or meditation. Basic to all religious living is contact with God through meditation. Consequently, it's axiomatic. You will be what your prayer makes you, no more, no less. Later on, we go into the fundamental concept of the religious life, the religious vows. An exact knowledge of what is entailed by these vows is most important. There can be no vague notions here. Just what are the privileges and obligations of a life of poverty, chastity, and obedience must be accurately imparted. You cannot allow a young man to embrace such a life unless he is fully aware of its import. Besides the three vows common to all religious orders, our novices must be instructed in the special fourth vow which we passionists profess, to promote devotion to the sacred passion of our Lord. The novices must be instructed as to the responsibilities involved in and the ways and means provided for the fulfillment of this sacred promise. Finally, we come to commentary on the rule of the Passionist Congregation. Chapter by chapter, paragraph by paragraph, this rule is subjected to minute scrutiny. Its meaning and implications are thoroughly investigated. Any perplexities or questions are clarified, and these constitute some of the responsibilities of the Master of Novices.
But the novitiate is not merely a time for gaining theoretical knowledge. There must be practical instruction. We might refer to it as on-the-job training. The mode of life that is to be followed for the rest of their days must become second nature to these young men. Now, since this life is one unbroken whole, we must insist on development in every area. This calls for a work program, a recreational program, a study program. The entire capacity of the man must be activated. You have just heard the novices in quiet rehearsal. Singing and chanting the praises of God is a prime monastic exercise. There are no servants in the monastery. The novice must learn to work with his hands. He must take care of his room, his clothing, his personal effects, as well as do the public offices of the monastery. He exerts his skill in making the signs or badges which after profession he will wear upon his tunic and mantle. The novices are taught to appreciate the old monastic axiom to work is to pray. The training of the entire man entails recreation, both physical and mental. In subsequent portions of this presentation, you will see the novices at play. This too is an integral part of their practical novitiate training. The spiritual and mental training is rounded out by classwork with both master and assistant master. Doctrine classes plus music Latin, scripture, and above all, lectures on ascetical and mystical theology keep the mental faculties keen and alert. But dominating all as the chief function of the noviceship stands the actual practice of the monastic life itself by prayer, meditation, and devotions, such as you observe here. Here in the chapel, for each one personally, is realized the fruition of all our teaching, all our training. And in turn, from here as from a dynamo, proceeds the strength and power to live out the resolutions begotten of meditation in day-to-day -day life. Difficulties, trials, tribulations, oft times receive their solution at prayer here in the chapel. Prayer is the atmosphere of the novice's whole life. This is the novitiate, the basic training ground of the religious priestly life. From this review, you may gather some idea of what are the duties and the responsibilities of the master of novices.
We have pointed out that this is both an active and a contemplative order. This combination makes the order attractive to many. I have stationed myself here in the chapel where they come to meditate, to chant the divine office, or otherwise uh, observe the contemplative side of the life. And I want to talk with one of the novices at this time. I want to talk with uh, Confrater Anthony. Uh, Anthony, uh, how important is the contemplative side of the life as we have pointed it out? Well, I think we could easily say that it's absolutely essential, at least for a monk, because in order to live under this rigorous discipline that we have here, it's necessary to have the time to keep our thoughts on God and see the end for the reason for our practices. Mm -hmm. And uh, this helps you, as you say, keep your objectives in mind and your goals. Now, when did you or why did you decide to become a priest? Well, about the end of high school, I realized I had to take a definite step. And uh, in doing so, I, I entered the uh, diocesan seminary in Philadelphia, where I lived. But once there, I found that uh, my particular need was uh, for a monastic ideal that was a channel for whatever talents that I have. Mm -hmm. And so you came here. Definitely. And uh, you are a novice. Uh, how are you finding the contemplative life? Well, I'd be very adolescent and just say I love it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how long have you been a novice? Well, I came here on July the 18th, and uh, it's been about six months now. And you have another six months to go. You're going to stick it out, I can tell. Oh, well, thank you for your <laughs> confidence. <laughs> Well, uh, and then as you uh, think back on this, uh, is there any specific uh, time that you decide, well, I'm going to be a priest, did you say, I'm going to be, and when well, did you take that action? Well, I think uh, it was a novena to St. Francis Xavier that did it for me, and that was when I was in sixth grade. Mm -hmm. But as I said, I didn't have the courage to take the definite step until after high school. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much, Anthony, for uh, your talk. Uh, this is just exactly what it looks like. It's a ball. Now, if this ball seems out of place here uh, in this atmosphere, it only goes to prove that in a monastery there is a time and a place for everything. Uh, not only worship, but for study and for meditation. And so, when that proper balance is play, recreation. Because recreation is as much a part of the life and routine as any other activity we have mentioned, the spirit and purpose of the community is maintained as these religious men, dressed in appropriate clothing, kneel together in prayer before going to the recreation area for sports and vigorous exercise. Obviously, this is no life for sissies. They charge about with as much vigor and enthusiasm as if their day had not started at 6 a.m. after a night of interrupted sleep. Looking upon this abundance of health, energy, and purpose, one is prompted to ask the question, what manner of men are these? The answer is different for each man. Some decided to enter the religious life when they were in the eighth grade, so they entered minor seminary for high school and two years of college before coming here as a novice. Others made their decision after they were out in the world pursuing an occupation. As can be seen by now, we lead here in the monastery a community life, which entails getting along with each other, working with each other. This is going to be our life until the end of life. And in order to uh, facilitate this um, getting along with each other, this appreciating the faults and the defects, but at the same time the high points of another person's personality, there's recreation. This is one of the main parts of the life in which you do get to know the other person and to work with him, enjoy yourself with him. You play basketball, baseball, sit around and talk. There's all sorts of activity, winter and summer, and you get to know each other, and hence you do end up with the community life. Here in the refectory, noon and evening meals are taken. They eat dinner at 12 noon and supper at 6.30. The food is plain and nutritious. Since fasting is a part of the monastic way of life, they do without meat three days a week. 
They eat together as a community, each at his assigned place. The priests who are home from the missions or whose duties keep them at the monastery are seated on one side of the refectory, the novices and brothers on the other. They eat in silence. At one end of the room, a novice reads aloud from an approved book or magazine. The subject is one judged to be of benefit to the group. So far as the novice is concerned, the hard life he is forced to live during this canonical year is a facet of monastic life calculated to discourage. If he is not mentally and physically suited to the life, here is the place and the time to find it out. Every minute of his day is allocated. His sleep is interrupted. He is denied meat. Prayer, fasting, and self-denial. He is really learning the meaning of those words. Careful and frequent evaluation is made on the progress of each novice. The master of novices knows the men thoroughly, but as the year of the novitiate nears its end, he calls them into his office one by one for private interviews to determine whether or not they wish to continue in the life and are ready to take the vows and become professed members. The canonical year is finished. Those who choose to continue are ready to begin their life under vows. According to their history, when Mary appeared in a vision before St. Paul of the Cross, she showed him this sign as a badge of the order. In order to wear it on his habit, the novice must take four vows, poverty, chastity, and obedience, plus the vow to promote devotion to the passion of Jesus. The day for profession has arrived. When all have gathered in the sanctuary, the priest blesses the signs to be given, saying, O oh Lord, may this emblem be a stumbling block to your enemies and an everlasting standard of victory to those believing in you. He then sprinkles them with holy water, saying, May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost be upon this sign. Each novice, in turn, kneels before the priest and is questioned concerning his serious intention of making a religious profession. Each is asked if he makes his decision freely. Each is questioned on his knowledge of the rules. When all have satisfactorily answered these questions, they return to their places for the sermon on the holiness of the religious profession. When the sermon is completed, the officiating priest returns to the altar with his attendants. As the ceremony continues, the novices prostrate themselves upon the floor as a sign of penance and self-mortification. They remain prostrate upon the floor while another priest reads the Passion according to St. John the Evangelist. This reading of the Gospel begins with Judas' betrayal of Jesus, tells how he was arrested and brought to trial before Pontius Pilate, how he suffered humiliation and was crucified on a hilltop between two thieves. The reading concludes with the words, he gave up the spirit and the novices rise to be professed. Going forward once more, each novice in turn kneels before the priest and placing his hands into the hands of the priest pronounces his profession. I confront a valentine of the Holy Spirit to vow and promise by a simple vow and promise, to Almighty God, to Blessed Mary, ever a virgin, to all the heavenly court, and to thee, Father, poverty, chastity, and obedience, as also a diligent endeavor to promote, according to my strength, in the hearts of the faithful, devotion to the passion of our Lord, according to the rules and constitutions of the discalced clerics of the most holy cross and passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The priest advises that everlasting life is his if he faithfully observes these vows. Then, placing the cross upon his shoulder, the priest says, Receive the cross of the Lord, deny yourself that you may share eternal life. Accept this crown of thorns, humble yourself and be subject to every creature for the love of God. The heart-shaped signs saying the passion of Jesus Christ are brought forward. As the signs are placed on his tunic and upon his mantle, the priest intones, accept this consecrated sign of salvation as an impregnable standard of your profession, and as a soldier under the noble standard, be nailed to the, with Christ to the cross. Lord, 
As a colorful and impressive conclusion to the solemn ceremony, the newly professed, together with other members of the community, form a stately procession around the church and back to the sanctuary. Now, as a professed member of the congregation, the young cleric embarks upon a period of training for the priesthood which closely resembles that of any priest, diocesan, or a religious community. I refer to the years in the major seminary. In order to cover those seminary years, let's talk with Father Robert. Where does he go from here now that he is a professed member of the community? Well, Ray, he goes from here to our houses of study. There he pursues the ordinary course of philosophy and theology. However, there's this distinction. Many religious orders and seminaries demand a third year of philosophy rather than two. And in that third philosophy, we put heavy emphasis on the study of modern philosophy and sociology, which is so important in our times. This is very much the same as a college would be for, under ordinary circumstances. Yes, with the exception of the emphasis on philosophy, which is not generally taken in most colleges these days with emphasis on practical and mm -hmm. subjects and technocracy. Now, under the heading of philosophy, there are many different courses. Oh, yes, there's logic and metaphysics and psychology and ethics and natural theology. Mm -hmm. And likewise, in theology, there are a great many different subjects. There are two major departments. There's dogma and morals. Then, of course, in those last four years, they study scripture for four years, canon law for three, Hebrew, uh, ascetical and mystical theology, and pastoral theology. And all of this leads, uh, aside from other factors, uh, they get a degree out of this, do they? At the end of the third year of philosophy, by power of the granted to us through the regents of New York, we give a Bachelor of Arts degree. And then this is fully accredited in the academic sense. Oh, yes, sir. You're, you're indicating there. Can I digress from these years that we're talking about for a moment to ask about your own uh, uh, profession and so forth? What led you into the priesthood? Well, I don't know. It was the grace of God and probably the interest in uh, monasteries and the personal contact I had with some seminarians and some passionate students. Mm -hmm. And uh, on this seminary years, you took just the things that we have been talking about. Oh, yes, but some expansion since my time. In my course, we're only two years philosophy. Mm -hmm. But as time goes on, the courses are being extended. More and more knowledge necessary oh, yes. in as this. As time goes on. Well, all of this training and these years uh, lead us then to the ordination, to his ordination as a priest. Is that right? Well, the seven years from the date of profession lead up by way of spiritual and intellectual training to the great moment towards which he aspired all the time when he might ascend the altar and take in his hands the chalice and the host and offer them to God in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. The great day of his life is at hand. Today he becomes a priest. As a passionist, he is likely to have spent 14 years preparing for this day. Ordinations have a profound significance for Catholics, and so with all the magnificence and splendor of this ancient rite, the young cleric realizes the words of the New Testament as he is taken from among men, is ordained for men in the things that appertain to God, that he may offer up gifts and sacrifices for sins.
place with the ordinance kneeling before the altar, the archdeacon calls those who are to be ordained to come forward. This is when the mandate is read. The mandate is a solemn warning to withdraw if they know themselves to be excluded by the law of the church. The mandate impresses upon the candidates the supreme importance and far-reaching consequences of the ordination. The mandate having been received, ordination begins by calling each candidate forward by name. As his name is read, the candidate steps forward, answering ad sum, and extinguishes his candle. This continues until the roll is completed. After the bishop has asked the clergy and the people present if they know any reason why these men should not be ordained, they prostrate themselves before the altar as a sign of their unworthiness and need of divine assistance. The choir chants the litany of the saints, which calls upon them to intercede with God that he may give worthy ministers to the church. The bishop blesses the candidates, praying that God will bless these elect, that he will bless and sanctify these elect, that he will bless and sanctify and consecrate these elect. In the holy atmosphere created by the prayers and admonitions of the faithful, the prostration continues in company with the litany of the saints. The most solemn moment is now at hand. This consecration by the bishop performed in silence, makes him a priest. This silent ceremony continues as all priests present impose hands on the newly ordained. All is hushed in silence. I kneel in utter silence as the grace of God descends to consecrate me to the holy priesthood. Human words are pow powerless at such moments, and silent I remain. I cannot tell in words of my unworthiness. I cannot chant my loneliness, my hopes and my desires, my love and my surrender, as the hand of God now reaches down to me. Having received the powers, rights, and privileges of the priesthood, the ordained are now vested with priestly vestments. The stole is arranged in the manner in which it is to be worn by the priest at Mass. In doing this, the bishop says, Receive the yoke of the Lord, for his yoke is sweet and his burden light. The chasuble or outer vestment is put on with the back part pinned in a fold, as the bishop says, Receive the priestly vestment by which charity is signified, for God is powerful to increase unto thee charity and perfection of work. All receive their vestments in like manner. Continuing the consecration of the ordained, the bishop prepares to anoint their hands with oil. In the Old Testament, holy oil was used extensively. The priests, the tabernacle, the prophets, and the kings were anointed. As he anoints, the bishop says, Deign, O Lord, to consecrate and sanctify these hands by this unction and our blessing, that whatsoever they shall bless may be blessed, and whatsoever they shall consecrate be consecrated and sanctified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Anointing symbolizes dedication to the service of God and the bestowal of grace. 
the anointed, keeping his hands together, goes to the side of the altar. Later, he kneels again before the bishop to symbolically receive the power to celebrate Mass. Now, all together and for the only time in the Roman Rite, all say Mass together with the bishop. Because they say Mass together, this ordination Mass is in reality their first Mass. As the Mass proceeds, they individually approach the altar and kiss it. Then they receive the kiss of peace from the bishop. Since all of this is a first experience for the newly ordained priest, the intense emotional tone of these ceremonies is to be appreciated. Having finished their first Mass, they recite the Apostles' Creed as a public profession of faith and then kneel to symbolically receive the power to forgive sins with the words, Whose sins thou shalt forgive, they are forgiven. Whose sins thou shalt retain, they are retained. The back of the chasuble is then unfolded with the words, May the Lord clothe thee with the robe of innocence. priests, they receive a solemn blessing from the bishop as priests forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And so the ordination ceremony is concluded in the same magnificence and splendor with which it began. go forth into the world as passionist priests, their responsibilities will lead them to work as missionaries both at home and abroad. They will conduct retreats for laymen, serve as chaplains in the armed forces, or participate in publication of their national magazine, The Sign. These and many other priestly duties will be theirs in the years ahead. Every young priest eagerly awaits the celebration of his first Mass, usually performed for members of his own family. Daily Mass will become a part of his very being, but this first low Mass is of great importance. Oh, bless the Lord again and again, who this day bestowed upon me the privilege of having a priest for a son. When he was born, I was filled with joy. I could scarcely believe that the little child was mine to care for. But the joy I felt seems to me as nothing in comparison with the higher supernatural joy which is mine today, a son and a priest. Yes, today I am the mother of a priest. This morning I saw my child stand at the altar. His tall figure, his grave movements from one part of the altar to another rendered him so dignified and majestic looking. He looked and acted like what he was, a minister of the Lord. And so a goal of years has been reached. A milestone has been passed. But the years have been only for preparation. The years of the priesthood lie ahead. This crucifix is a hallmark of the Passionist Father. He wears it in his belt when he preaches the Passion of Jesus. 
to learn some of the responsibilities that he may assume during his years as a priest, let's talk with Father Cornelius McArdle. Uh, Father Cornelius, this crucifix is a hallmark, uh, which is very significant to your order, isn't it? That's right, Ray. This crucifix was given to us at the time of our profession, and it is worn by us in all of our ministerial activities of preaching. The great goal of a passionist is to be a preacher of the passion. That is the purpose behind all of his years of training, his years of contemplative living. And so the ultimate ambition of almost every passionist is that he be a missionary. The great ambition of the ordinary passionist is to be a preacher of missions and retreats to the laity and the clergy. You mentioned being a missionary. Uh, you mean to foreign lands as well as home. Yes, we do mission work in both foreign and, and domestically. For example, we have had for many years missions in China, which were closed out by the communist domination of that country. And we have since then taken over mission fields in the Philippine Islands and in the West Indies. We also do missionary work among the colored in our own Southland. What about uh, continued study? Do you study after you have finished the major seminary years that we have seen? Yes, we do a, an extra year of study after our seven years of major seminary studies. It's called a year of pastoral theology and homiletics. During that time, we are more fully acquainted with the duties of the ministry and also are trained specifically in the art of preaching. Mm -hmm. And so the work of a passionist father is a very full life, isn't it? It is not only a very full life, but it is almost completely a ministerial life. Very little of the administrative facts of the priesthood enter into the passionist apostolate. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, uh, Father Cornelius. It has been a rare privilege to bring you this insight into the way of life of a group of religious men, the Passionist Fathers. Throughout the program in the background, you have been hearing the music of the novice choir here at the monastery. Now, as we leave the air, let's listen to that choir with some more music. Whoa. 